Everyone's feeling ready. Um, welcome everyone to this wonderful lecture. We're very excited to have the La Quinta Historical Society here today. I know I'm seeing many familiar faces here, but for those of you who are new to the museum and the historical society, we're actually separate entities, but we at the museum feel super lucky that we get to work with the historical society. They own the archives that we display here at the museum. So when you go check out that local history exhibit, that's all a part of the La Quinta Historical Society's archives. So we're so excited to have them here today sharing all of their knowledge and fun facts about our beautiful gem of the desert. Um, a couple, now they were interested, our panel, I would introduce you to our esteemed panel, but we're gonna keep you in suspense. Um, they, they're going to introduce themselves as they go, so this will be fun. But they kind of wanted to get to know a little bit about you. Could we show by a raise of hands how many of us here are La Quinta residents? Most of us. How about other places in the valley? All right. How, now, if you're here in La Quinta, how many of us live in the Cove? Quite a few of us. How about North La Quinta? Gated communities? Anything else we wanted to know about our La Quinta residents? <laughs> Who loves La Quinta? Yeah. Perfect, this is the perfect audience. So um, I'm going to turn it over to them here in just a moment, um, but I did wanna point out here that you are watching some wonderful historic photos here in La Quinta. These aren't necessarily going to be um, going along, syncing with what's being discussed, but you'll see some wonderful historical photos, and those are all a part of the archives of the La Quinta Historical Society. Um, so lots of wonderful images. Um, if there's something you have a question about on one of these corners, some of these people. Yes. And with that, let's, shall we welcome our La Quinta Historical Society panel today. I am secret speaker number one. <laughs> but my name is Mary Lawson. I do live in La Quinta. And I'm here today to tell you about La Quinta prior to 1900. So it was a cool spring morning, the first time that I laid eyes on our beautiful Santa Rosa Mountains. It was 1996, and I arrived on the back of a Harley Fat Boy. It was yellow and creamy white, and it was some bike, I'll tell you that. And driving, I remember being driven that day by a very handsome man, too. At the gas station at the corner of Highway 111 and Washington Boulevard, I remember getting off the bike and flipping my visor up and looking at the most gorgeous mountains I had ever seen. They were truly majestic. And all these years later, I feel very lucky to wake up every morning to see these mountains and to see my Harley boy too. <laughs> the, Santa Ran <laughs> the Santa Rosas are part of the Pacific Peninsular Range and they're primarily located here in La Quinta but also extend into the San Diego County and Imperial County. In the olden days, the Peninsular Range began to break off at the west coast of Mexico, right at the Pacific, Pacific Rise, which is located along the floor of the Pacific Ocean and extended northward under the continent. This is rifting, and it extended under the Salton Sea, near the geothermal fields, and some extinct volcanoes at the south. The rifting actually separated the Teutonic plates, and it was the start of our famous and still active San Andreas Fault. I don't know if you know, but if you go to the top, the berm in the cove, you can look out over the valley and you can actually see where the San Andreas Fault is. So if you haven't done that, you should really do it. Santa Rosas are pr relatively a short mountain range, only 30 miles in length. And even though it's a short range, we still get plenty of nice foreign flana, <laughs> fauna and flora. We have the California palms, plant palms, San Herbinia, 
yuccas, and mesquite. And of course, that's along with our peninsular bobcats, quail, and of course, our very favorite, the bighorn sheep. I can't even imagine La Quinta without having all these things. Another prominent feature of the Santa Rosa Mountains is the prehistoric Lake, Chu sorry, Lake Cahuilla. This lake dates back several millennium. The lake was formed by a freshwater flow from the Colorado River and water from the uh, Salton Sink. Now, I, I didn't know what that was, so I looked it up, and it is actually the shed water from the Salton Sea, which is all around the Salton Sea. Geologists estimate that this ancient lake periodically reached 100 miles long, 30 miles wide, and 300 feet deep. It also makes the surface of it over six times larger than our current Salton Sea. The lake ran from north of, ha of Point Happy all the way to the Delta in Imperial County, which is over 150 miles. I think a lot of houses that we live in today, mine is, I know, are in the areas where the ancient lake was. It has been proven that human habitation along the shorelines dated as far back as 2,500 years ago. And this is based on finding of indigenous peoples, villages, fish traps, petroglyphs, and other artifacts that they unearthed. The petroglyphs and the fish traps, they're still visible today, not far from Trilogy, at the corner by Jackson and 66. And I've seen them, and along, you can see them there, and when you go there, there's also places that they have flat stones that they've dug out and they're kind of curved that they use to mash things up with their mortars. There's also cremated remains, along with other artifacts, were also discovered at present day Trilogy. Another interesting feature, I'm sorry, I'm another interesting feature near present day Lake Cahuilla is a Martinez slide. This is considered one of the largest rock slides in American history, or United States history. It was likely triggered by a seven point plus magnitude or higher uh, an earthquake and it was centered at by one of the nearby peaks and it was happened before 1680. You can actually see the slide at the end of Madison Street and 62nd Street, and it's all along the bottom. Our desert Cahuilla lived in approximately 20 villages in lower Coachella Valley. This included present-day La Quinta and places east of here. These native people were a hunter-gatherer society. There were many small encampments that were created around the ancient lake as the lake provided both plant and small game resources for the tribe. Actually, I, when I read that, I pictured the mountain there, and you know, it's dusk, and there's the lake, and then all these little fires around it. Amazingly, the Cahuilla had a thriving community in this harsh environment. The mall, M-A-U-L, is what they call their environment, and it provided everything that they could possibly need. It was their pharmacy, where they found plants and herbs to cure their ales, it provided their shelter and clothing. It was their grocery store, providing food and water and wood for their fires. They also had semi-permanent villages in the mountains where they would move every summer and visit their mountain desert past Cahuilla relatives. Mesquite trees and native fan palms were very important resources for this society. The fruit they harvested annually by Cahuilla women and stored in granaries for later use or would be ground into mash cakes using mortars. The cakes could then be stored and dry, dried and stored and put away for later. Now, I bet you didn't know this. The Cahuilla were one of the first American Indian tribes to dig their own water wells. And this was done where they would go to the wash and they would dig down to the water level, which is about five feet under ground level. And they'd have a series of steps leading down to them, which would have been five feet below the ground level. A few of these ancient wells still exist today, and the Cahuilla call the wells they dug Earth Oyas. The La Quinta area had two well-known sites, one near Point Happy, which was known as Cavanish. Now get this, Cavanish is one of the oldest known places in the desert where people are. 
So it's the oldest known place to human beings in the desert and one of the most important archaeological sites in Riverside County. I thought that was pretty interesting. There was also another well in the area of the cove called Kota Vitwe. That was near Traditions Golf Course, where it is now. The Kuya traded with various tribes that had little contact with native, uh, non-native explorers prior to 1772. While some Kuya may have had earlier contact with European outside of their villages, it's believed that the first Spanish explorer to reach La Quinta may have been Pedro Feje in 1772. This is based on research by Harry Quinn and others. And I would say I believe Harry Quinn. <laughs> we believe that Pedro Feje traveled east of San Diego to the Barongo Desert area and then traveled along the base of the West Side Mountains, then north to the, Qui to the Coachella Valley. It's also possible that he visited the Cahuilla village of Cavendish. In Feje's diary, it detailed that in 1772, he traveled to San Diego in pursuit of deserters. Um, and I'm not sure if those were slaves or army. They might have been both army deserters. In his description of the desert he traveled through, he included palm trees. While Cahuilla villages are commonly located within palm groves, and his des description supported the Cahuilla Valley, Valley San Gregorian Pass route rather than what later was called the Anza Trail. Unfortunately, later expeditions resulted in the Cahuilla losing large tracts of their land and surrendering control to the Spanish. In 1821, Mexico secured independence from Spain and the Cahuilla fared a bit better under their control. After the American War, after the Mexican-American War ended and the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1842, Mexico formally seceded California to the United States. The United States had created reservations and initiatives to relocate indigenous people. And again, the Cahuilla overall conditions didn't really improve. The Desert Cahuilla were assigned to the Torres Martinez Reserve Reservation established in 1876, which remains active today. Some of this reservation land was located just outside of, is located just outside of Trilogy, with their main reservation located in Oasis. They operate many businesses today, including the Red Earth Casino, in case you'd like to visit. <laughs> the descendants of early <coughs> desert Cahuilla, they continue to work and thrive in the desert and share their cultures and traditions with all of us. There's a few things that I looked up because I didn't know, so I'm just going to throw them out here in case you don't know them too. One of them is the word Cahuilla. The word Cahuilla comes from a similar sounding word, Spanish word, meaning powerful or powerful ones. And I think we can say that's a really good meaning for our desert Cahuilla. What did they eat? They ate large and small game from deer and rabbits and even mice. I read that in the past, in a past excavation, it revealed rock cairns lined with brush and made into a big trap for a big horn sheep. So I'm thinking they ate big, big horn sheep when they could find it. Birds were very important to their diet, such as quail, ducks, geese, and other seasonal birds. I didn't even, I didn't read anything about them eating roadrunners. <laughs> but if things were tough, you just never know. They also fished and the Cahuilla women would gather acorns, nuts, beans, and fruits. They baked bread from acorn flour. When things were tough and food was scarce, they ate or acorns, beans, corn, squash, seeds, but they also ate lizards and rattlesnakes. So how did they live? They traditionally lived in shelters called kishes and brush homes. You can see that there. They were made with, um, they were usually circular with domed roofs. They were made with arrowhead, arrowwood poles and the arrowwood was flexible, and they dip it, keep it in water to make it more flexible when they could build with it. And they would pull them up on the top and tie them together. Some also lived in, a, in kind of thatched adobe homes and sun shelters. And the sun shelters were like a patio, and they probably put palm fronds or other types of material over to give them some sun protection. So what did the Cahuilla wear? Well, originally they did not wear much at all. 
Um, later, the women wore American native, or later the men wore American native breech cloths, and the women wore knee-length skirts made out of bark from the mes mesquite tree. Um, and shirts were not necessary for anyone in the Kauia. And so these pictures, I think, have just been dressed up a bit. <laughs> and children in the culture often wore nothing. I did read that they may have worn rabbit skin robe, robes at night when, when the weather became cooler. And they also wore sandals made out of deer hide and certain types of cactus fa fabric, fiber, fibers. Uh, what were the Kuya known for? Um, they were still, and they're still known for their hand dug wells um, that they dug, the ones we, we spoke about earlier. And the tribe was also well known for their basketry, and they made beautiful baskets, some of which you can see today upstairs in the exhibit. I think they have some shoes up there too, right? Yeah, so there's some shoes up there too. Okay, is there any questions? Well, I, there, are, there are acorns. They used acorns and they made bread out of it, or flatbreads out of it. But probably for a lot of things, actually. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? I have never seen any quail here except on the sign. <laughs> There's a lot of quail here. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, lots of quail. I think it just depends where you live. Like I live a little further out by Avenue 58 and uh, Monroe, uh -huh. and we have lots of quail. No rabbits because we have coyotes around them. Oh, okay. never, seen, I, never seen a rabbit, I think, in the 11 years we've lived there. Maybe one. But roadrunners, quail, especially during the spring coming up, probably when they'll have the mom and dad and all the little babies. Uh -huh. I saw this morning. Did you see <laughs> 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 No more questions? <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, Mary. Hi, all. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Blanton. I'm a board member also with the Historical Society. And I'm going to speak a little bit on... Um, still prior to the year 1900, the Bradshaw Trail and the early settlers. So in the mid-1800s, the La Quinta area was known as the Santa Rosa Cove area. Knowledge of the primary Cahuilla route across the Colorado desert was relayed to experienced guide William David Bradshaw's party in May of 1862 by Chief Cabazon, who was the appointed head of the desert Cahuilla. And most of you have heard of the Cabazon, the town, and, and also the Cabazon band of uh, uh, Mission Indians, which is where Fantasy Springs Casino is. Um, early explorers, and especially those seeking quick routes to the gold fields around the Colorado River near La Paz County, Arizona, would use the route and refer to it as Bradshaw Trail. The trail provided many pack and freight wagon ex expeditions along with the Colorado Stage and Express Line, which was a stop at the site of ancient Kuia Wells, which is the present day La Quinta Cliff House, and close proximity to Norman Happy Lumbeck's store and the stables, which, the stables which became known as Point Happy uh, Ranch. Uh, President Lincoln signed the Homestead Act into law on uh, May 20th, 1862, granting all U.S. citizens and immigrants intending to become naturalized citizens, 21 years of age or older, 160 acres of land patents in exchange for improvements to the land growing crops, residing on the property for five years. I mean, this is the way they got our ancestors to come out to the, the desert at the time. Uh, much of the land was tribal territory ceded to the government at the end of the Mexican-American War. On March 3rd, 1877, Congress passed the Desert Land Act, also referred to as the Desert Land Entry Act. This essentially amended the Homestead Act of 1862. Both of these acts promoted development, irrigation, and reclamation of arid lands in the West, such as Norman Lumbeck's Point Happy Ranch, which his widow Anna later filed for homestead status in the early 1900s. Ten months earlier, on May 29, 1876, the Southern Pacific Railroad became the first scheduled passenger mail 
and freight service between Los Angeles and Indio. In 1888, the Southern Pacific engineers, in searching for water for their locomotives and station houses, obtained small artisan flows at Thermal and Coachella. Six years later, a successful, a successful well was put down at Walters, which is now called Mecca. This provided definite proof that water did indeed exist under this portion of the desert basin with sufficient pressure to rise up to the surface. So this fur further encouraged ranchers and commercial entrepreneurs to settle and homestead in the area, along with the growing number of tourists visiting the beautiful Santa Rosa Mountains. That's it. <laughs> Any questions on my, on my part? Yes. When you first began your talk, um, and you were talking about um, going to Point Happy, the, the thing that you guys put up there, the wedding? Yes. Um, yeah, can you tell us about that? The stagecoach. So that, the stagecoach. So before, um, originally that was Point Happy Ranch, which actually at one time encompassed all the way down to where the Catholic Church, St. Francis of Assisi is. And, but uh, they sold off the portion of the land where they have the homes that were built in the 60s, Highland Palms, and then um, the church. I think they sold that off in the early 60s, I believe. And uh, so that was Point Happy Ranch up until 2003 or something like that, early 2000s, and when they sold it off to, to developers. And about five or six years ago, we put up that placard, because we, uh, we do have plaques on some historical buildings throughout La Quinta, so that's what that, so there was no place to put a plaque, I think it was a great idea that we did this stagecoach, and if you're ever able to stop, yeah, I know, yeah. and uh, stop and, and read it. it, it talks about the history of uh, Point Happy, and um, so it's right, um, Simon Drive, and um, one, Simon Drive in Washington, well the one side Simon Drive, the other side is, is it Point? What is it? It's Point Happy Way. Yeah, Point Happy Way, yeah. And a, a lady, for those of you who've lived here a, a little while, Louise Neely, who used to run the museum when it was in the, the old building, she grew up in Point Happy. I mean, she was born there in 1925, I think it was, and uh, went to school there. There used to be a little schoolhouse, and her parents, I mean, she lived there for, quite a, until she got married or went to college, got married and, and moved away. But uh, if she passed away, I think it's about probably five or six years now. Five years. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Any other questions? Was, was this area uh, called by the small settlements like India or was it, did it have one name and others? No, I mean, this whole area here, like when India was, um, India was basically started when the train came through in you know, late 1800s because they needed, of course, the, the stop every so many you know, miles for um, water and steam and the workers for the train. So this whole area was basically just you know, India or outlying area up until La Quinta was really... Yeah, until the, 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 the hotel. Yeah. What about Coachella, the thing I say the Coachella, that the, the name Coachella kind of derives from Kauia, maybe? I mean, I've heard. Oh, oh Conchella. Oh, Out of the, the, the okay. There are shells here. The conch shells. <clears throat> Jeff's going to talk about I'm going to deal with that. Oh, yeah. But I can tell you that when Eric Morgan built the La Quinta Hotel, he uh, meeting with local ranchers, uh, one in particular by the name of Henderson Ranch, uh, had, Henderson had traveled extensively to Mexico and in a, a Mexican estate called uh, La Quinta, there was a central house where the, where the kitchen and the meals were served and then surrounded 
around him to see this, uh, and they, those were called Lahika. Uh, and that's the name that Harry Morgan, Henry Morgan, pardon me, uh, uh, chose for the uh, uh, hotel when he did the same thing, which is a central uh, kitchen and service area surrounded by the little casitas. Uh, Walter. Walter. <laughs> yes. Sir. One more. Uh, could you repeat the, uh, the water tablet? Was that discovered, so to speak, by the SD Railroad? Well, basically, they discovered that water was, and they must have heard from from the Indian yeah. Indians that you just dig down a little bit, and there's there's water. So the, we had these artesian wells that were only about, I think, five feet five feet deep. So, um, and, and this, the train coming through the desert, they needed water for the. Yeah. The steam engines. And the Bradshaw so. Trail. And the Bradshaw Trail. Yeah. yeah. So, any other questions? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, not remembering Walter's first name, I, it's not a great start, but uh, my name is Jeff Smith, and uh, I've been living here in the valley for about 45 years with my, mom, with my wife, Al. And uh, having taught school and worked with the uh, historical society, we've just tried to pay attention and learn a little bit about the background of this place. And I'm gonna cover the areas uh, of the, the first 50 or 60 years of the 20th century, which believe it or not is the last century, but it is. Uh, we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to start with the homesteaders and the people who came here to take advantage of the water and the crops that would grow here. Uh, then we're going to talk about the next big event for La Quinta, which is the La Quinta Hotel, uh, a, a major development for this community. And then we'll follow it up with the Desert Club, which is another uh, important uh, place that sadly is no longer here, but the uh, casitas that were built to uh, be part of the Desert Club. Fortunately, there are still 65 or so of them around in the community. Uh, but let's start with the homesteaders. From about 1900, uh, people understood that you could grow several crops a year and with a railroad get it to market. And entrepreneurs came down here, set up ranches and farms, and began to uh, uh, produce agricultural products, grow citrus, um, and dates later on as well. And uh, we, we start with um, the importance of water, I have to say, is, is uh, crucial to this area. Most folks over the, the last couple of centuries just wanted to get through this godforsaken place as quickly as they could. Uh, but it was only after the discovery of the artesian water here that with a water table of five feet, you can dig a well at five feet, and uh, taking advantage of what the, uh, what the Kauia had done, they understood that water here would allow them, once they treated the fields properly, to grow lots and lots of uh, row crops and uh, um, a variety of other uh, uh, commercially attractive products. It starts with uh, the uh, Marshall Green Ranch in 1902. Um, this is the area now where the, the tradition where Hacienda Delgado is. That was uh, uh, built in 1902. And uh, from there we had later on uh, the Point Happy Ranch. Happy Lundbeck built a, a, a farm, a ranch, and um, a little store uh, in right at the corner of Point Happy up here on uh, Washington and 111. Perfect place for a ranch because it's out of the wind around the corner. Uh, and uh, he was there with his wife and they, we actually have the documents where his wife was eventually given uh, the, uh, ownership of the land when they proved up on it long enough for the homestead to become their own property. Uh, and the records of that are right here. Um, there were other ranches uh, along what is now Washington, uh, then called uh, Marshall's Road, after the Marshall Ranch at the far end. Uh, 
the Burkett Ranch was built, uh, and then later the Pedersen Ranch was established around 1917. And Pedersen is the man we think responsible for giving Walter Morgan the idea for the name La Quinta. So we are, I think, second only to uh, uh, Beverly Hills is named after a hotel, and we are also, I think, the only two places in the country so named. Um, so about 1922, Point Happy uh, was purchased by a uh, wealthy um, socialite and um, entrepreneur, uh, Chauncey Morgan and his wife Marie. And from there they built the um, a Point Happy Date Garden and Ranch. And of course that became uh, a major part of this city's history as well. Um, the road that we now today call Washington is, uh, was of course then called Marshall's Road and it went to Marshall's Cove or Santa Rosa Cove. No name La Quinta early on associated with this area. The Hunts later came in the 1930s and, and established uh, a number of uh, facilities here uh, in the valley. The next important event to occur in this area of the, this part of the century was the building of the La Quinta Hotel. There's a wonderful story and we have no idea whether it's true or not, but it's a wonderful story, so I'll tell it, uh, of uh, Walter Morgan and uh, another soldier in a cold, damp, wet uh, trench in World War I in France, uh, saying to themselves, "They'll, when it, if we ever get out of here, we're gonna go to a place where we'll never have to put up with these conditions again. And uh, as I said, it's a lovely story, I hope it's true, but, he later uh, searched around for property out here in the desert and found 1,400 acres in what is now the La Quinta uh, Resort and Club, which we call, the La Quinta, we old timers call the La Quinta Hotel. Uh, and he decided to, in 1921, he was, uh, uh, he purchased those acres. And in 19, before 1927, they had the La Quinta Hotel built. Um, uh, he hired an architect, Gordon Kaufman, who designed those wonderful casitas that surrounded the main house area. And because of his status as a socialite, and particularly with his contacts in the Hollywood movie industry, Morgan was able to convince people to come out here because of, I think the number one reason is privacy. Uh, they could come out here, and you have to imagine that none of this up here in the cove was here. It was just a hotel. You could look south and see virtually nothing. Uh, and people would come out here from LA on the train. They would uh, come to Indio, take a coach by car, probably out here to the hotel and could remain totally out. of. We didn't even have telephones uh, out in this area until later on after the uh, place was established. Uh, Walter Morgan became the first postmaster of uh, La Quinta, uh, and the area of the hotel picked up the same name. Um, the hotel was uh, uh, attractive to those in Hollywood because when a contract movie actor uh, left the community, they of course couldn't come back for reshoots and other kinds of things. They had to stay fairly close to uh, Hollywood. Well, if they came out here, they were just a day's train ride away from the city, so if they were called back in, they could come out here and be absolutely private and uh, away from everyone, uh, totally on their own uh, at the hotel, and then they could get back into LA if they were called to do so. Um, the story goes that those in the movie business who came out to the desert to be seen and noticed went to Palm Springs. Those who came out here wanting privacy came to the hotel, and uh, many of them did. Of course, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, private, uh, excuse me, uh, silent movie stars at first, uh, but then later um, we have, after the grand opening in 1927, uh, I've got a list of names here of uh, movie stars that came. We've got um, Marie Dressler, uh, Errol Flynn, uh, uh, in, in, uh, 
uh, any major Hollywood movie star made it out here at one time or another. Um, the next event which is significant to the development of the, uh, of the La Quinta area was the building of the Desert Club. Now, the Desert Club was the idea of a man by the name of Harry Kiner, who in 1932 decided that he would build a complement to a mountain Peter Pan club in the uh, San Bernardino Mountains uh, around Big Bear. The idea was that he would have the summer, no air conditioning, remember back then. In the summer months, people would be in the mountains, and then in the winter months, they'd come down here in, and enjoy the, the desert club, where if they rented or bought a small, uh, l l a little uh, casita out here, they would have access to the pool and the bar and the restaurant and all of the other facilities that went along with the Desert Club, uh, which was built a little bit later in the process. Um, so in 1935, they began building the actual casitas. It was the first subdivision of this area. They had to put in a water system. They had to get electricity out here. Uh, they uh, were uh, then beginning to sell these sites and rent these lots. And can you imagine the economic climate in the middle of the depression to come out here and try to sell what would amount to luxury homes to people? Uh, the whole idea was on a little shaky uh, economic grounds from the very beginning. Uh, but Kiner then uh, handed, it over, handed the operation over to two of his salesmen uh, and they uh, worked on building a place that would be attractive to a very upscale market. Um, but when they, when they did this, they got people out here uh, and they had waiters dressed in liveried outfits. They had a very posh bar and, and restaurant, uh, but it never really took off but when the war broke out, it was basically still kind of limping along and it never really had the massive economic success that anybody thought it would. But because of the building of those little casitas, which were the original places built in La Quinta, in what is now La Quinta up here in the cove, um, that's our legacy uh, to this day. Uh, of, the, of the Desert Club. Unfortunately, uh, when the club began to deteriorate after the, uh, well, after the 1980s or so, uh, it was uh, ceded over to the city and sadly, uh, the city had no uh, uh, ability to rehabilitate the place. No, so it was used as a, uh, for the La Quinta Volunteer Fire Department to practice as it burned down. This wonderful old building that was a design by, uh, let me make sure I find the designer of the club here, um, uh, of the building, um, Charles Lee, who was a famous uh, designer of movie houses all over the, the country, uh, built a art deco, kind of an odd looking structure. It was referred to as sort of the ship of the desert. It looked like a uh, riverboat, more or less, out here. And uh, when uh, a fire occurred in the 1960s, uh, they rehabbed it again and made sort of an odd mixture of, of the Spanish revival style of the La Quinta Hotel and the Art Deco. It was a rather odd looking structure, but it had the tennis courts, which by the way are still there. Uh, it's all that's left right now. The pool has been filled in, the, the, and the club, of course, was burned down. Um, so we've got the Desert Club in operation. When World War II broke out, uh, the La Quinta Hotel was shut down. Uh, there were no um, uh, troops that occupied the place. Uh, there are some rumors that some of Patton's staff from Camp Young may have used the place, but uh, there are also stories of Patton himself coming to the Desert Club, which uh, remained in operation throughout the war. 
After the war, the, an attempt was made to bring back this sort of upscale image of the Desert Club, uh, and it really didn't work very well. Be but people who lived here, and people who could vacation here over a weekend, for example, from Los Angeles or San Diego, would come out here, and it became more of a family-oriented place, never quite getting that same posh feel that I think they intended originally. Um, Basically, that's all I have for you now, except to say that what questions you have, we can try to answer. Yes, ma'am. I've, I've read and heard various things on the actual location of the Desert Club. So are you saying it's in, it was the park? It is where, uh, yeah, that, that's where it is. And uh, the old building was along, uh, I'm not sure what it's called now. Is it Durango? That where it was... Uh, uh, it, well, it was the old Avenue uh, 52, which used to come out uh, <coughs> on the south side of the, uh, well, it's, it's where the current park and pool are. And, where the, and the, the tennis courts that are there, uh, the ones at the southern end, the, the last three tennis courts, uh, maybe pickleball now, who knows, but uh, it, it, uh, uh, those were the original tennis courts. The pool has been filled in. Yes, ma'am. The developer of the Desert Club, he's the person that subdivided the code yes. into the 50 by 100 lots. Because no one intended to live here year round then. You'd just come for the summer. You'd stay in your little casita and uh, enjoy the weather here. And when it got too hot, go back up to the mountainside. That was the idea, anyway. And, yes, ma'am. Sure, sure. Well, actually, I, I hesitate to say that with Judy uh, here, but Frank, Frank Capra, the story goes, uh, and the lady who told the story is right over there, is that Frank Capra, when he and his wife retired at the um, uh, Laquino Hotel, a resort and club, uh, came to Judy and said, I'm bored to tears. I need a job. And so she gave him one, right? And he became the greeter most every day from, uh, you know. Weekdays, four. Week, like 10 in the morning, he still time to go to lunch. I see. And, <laughs> and, 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 and the front door and greeted the guests, and I always say, that means you're not having Steven Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> Jeff, can I just add? Yes. Yeah, speak of the devil and his, his wife, yeah. And uh, when, uh, the film with Shangri-La in it, which is the name of which I'm having a senior moment for, was on television just the other night. Uh, oh, well, that, that, that's a, that was not Frank Capra, but uh, yeah. Anything else in the way of questions? Yes, sir. Lake Frida wants to watch water break. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, if you go up here to the corner of um, where the freeway meets Jefferson, was the northern end of Lake Cahuilla, and the southern end was all the way down to the bottom of Laguna Salada, which is uh, w well below the Mexican border, uh, and that whole area would fill, and then it would uh, evaporate and uh, then fill again. And it, we think it's happened at least four or five times uh, in the geological past. But, and, and from the, studying the uh, remains, the archeolo archeological remains, you can see evidence of their villages, the Cahuilla villages, moving across the desert to stay with the shoreline as it receded. Uh, and you've got the fish traps and the other evidence uh, of the, riparian, I think it's called, river, uh, uh, environment, uh, which, can you imagine, that was a pretty pleasant place to be if it wasn't, it was it, plenty of water, probably the climate was not quite as harsh as it is now, 
pretty attractive place for a hunter-gatherer civil or culture to exist. Yes, sir. Well, when I, when I came here in 1974, I found a part that fit my Kenmore washer on one that had been dumped up there, uh, and we were able to unscrew the thing and take it back to our house to make it work. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, and we have evidence, too, that Desert Club stuff was dumped up there, and I'm sure uh, the hotel stuff as well, because... People didn't respect the desert much. After all, this is the middle of nowhere. They had no appreciation of the value of the place. And we don't know how deep that dump goes. Every time it rains, of course, we see more of the uh, glass and other evidence of the dump up there. But how many, um, I'm trying to think how many dumpsters. We took about five of the biggest dumpsters that Birdtech has and had, uh, well, they were convict crews, actually, uh, yeah. pulling stuff out of that. And that was before um, the museum manager at the time and I, we took that back and went up there and dug through and retrieved some of the folks. Wow. Um, yeah. 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 Well, that was a real quick 50-year travel, but go ahead. Yes, I do. It's called the, let's see, Carmelita del Valle, Santa Carmelita del Valle water system that was made with, and we're, we're, we are sure about this, World War I ship boiler pipe that was uh, welded together and used as a water line up and down uh, the streets in the cove here, which was completely deteriorated by the time I moved here in 1974, they spent a lot of time shutting water off and trying to put, to join together rusted pipe and rusted pipe and rusted pipe. And it was, we constantly had uh, the uh, leaks all over the place. Kids from the high school said that they used to come out and spread a few seeds underneath the uh, uh, water, uh, the fire hydrants out here because they all leaked so much that in another couple of months they had a crop waiting for them to pick up. Um, we, we, only, we only found about that later on, however. Uh, anything else? Well, great. Thank you very much, folks. Appreciate it. Rusty pipe. Uh, that's that's part of the water system, and the originals are in the exhibit over at City Hall. And when you see the yellow pipe that sticks up like this, real narrow thing, that was a fire hydrant. So it, it's in here somewhere. Uh, my name is Kay Wolf, and uh, I've lived here for 43 years up in the Cove. And uh, I came here because uh, my husband's family bought two lots up at the top of the cove in about 1946 or 7 and built a little bitty house there, no air conditioning. Um, but, it, but they built a little house up there, and so his family used that as a, summer, or as a winter retreat place. So my husband, Fred Wolf, whose name you'll hear off and on, uh, he'd been coming here since he was a young man. And... Um, when I married Fred, we started coming here in 1976, and we moved here in 1980. So, 1980, I'm here to talk about incorporation, because uh, incorporation made quite a difference in the look of what we now call La Quinta. In fact, if we hadn't incorporated when we did in, 19, in the early 1980s, we would not be sitting in La Quinta now, we would be sitting in Indio. So uh, 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 this area, which was called La Quinta after the hotel, um, was a part of Riverside County, of course, historically. And there was no church or school, no grocery store, no mail delivery, no animal control, 
little police presence, no mandatory trash collection, no four or six lane roads or streets, no supermarket, no bank, no shopping in the city limits. I used to tell the city council, I can't buy a dress in La Quinta. No old town, no curbs and gutters, no sewer system, and a poor water system. There was, in this area, a lot of vacant lots and desert. There was a Circle K that had a gas station. Simon Motors was located on 111. It's, it was Chevrolet Cadillac then, and it's still Chevrolet Cadillac. That's where the Catholic Church used to hold its Sunday ceremonies. They'd move out the Cadillacs and bring in the altar. <laughs> We had Ace Hardware, uh, which is where the uh, uh, Angel View thrift shop is now. We had a small post office at this, when I moved here at the Tampico Market, although they said there had been a post office at the hotel, and one lady says that there was a post office right over here at the construction office, this two-story building where the vet used to be. Uh, and I imagine that the, the name La Quinta be, became really officially associated with the area when there was a postal, uh, I want to say zip code, but a post office at the hotel. So I think that determined our destiny right there. We did have a recently built gas station, which is Tower Market. There was one traffic signal, one very famous hotel, one country club, one golf course, La Quinta Country Club. And, some people say that golf course was the first in the valley, although I think that Palm Springs argues with that. There were three restaurants, Chez Monique, take a guess what that was about. <laughs> the, the Sandbar, which is still there under the same ownership, and well, where an, uh, Ranchito is located now, uh, it had been um, Rosie's Market, which was uh, Rosie Funtas, which I think some of, she just died recently. So the identity was really created from our famous hotel, from our Desert Club. The Desert Club was functioning when I moved here in 1980. We were members for $240 a year, and that meant we had access to the swimming pool, the tennis courts, and uh, any, the, the restaurant was open to the public. So our, we were called La Quinta because of the two famous resorts. We had two citizens organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, who uh, coined the name Gem of the Desert, and the uh, Property Owners Association. And these two organizations sort of were a quasi-government because if the community had problems, like no police, you know, those kinds of problems, problems with the uh, water system and everything, these two groups had a little bit of clout when they went to Riverside and made complaints to get some more services from the, from the county. And there's also a certain amount of community pride. The uh, Chamber of Commerce was a very social organization in those days, not as business oriented as it is now. And it would have social events, dances. I even think I remember going to dances. Jeff, where did you go? Did you go to dances there? Um, and there was a cleanup day always in the cove because we didn't have any trash pickup. That's why everybody took their trash up to the top of the cove and dumped it because there was no trash pickup. <clears throat> so we would have cleanup day and we would all bring our trash bags such as they were and go out and pick up trash. And um, so under construction about that same time in the early 1980s was the Vons uh, Shopping Center and Santa Rosa Cove, which was originally going to call itself La Quinta Cove, but the name La Quinta had such a dubious reputation because of no trash pickup, no police, you got it. Um, they uh, decided to call it Santa Rosa Cove instead of La Quinta Cove, but now we have a La Quinta Cove. So the problems that we had before incorporation that we just talked about, there were no building standards to speak of, so a lot of, in the late 1970s, a lot of the small lots in the cove were bought up by developers and they put up kind of shabby homes because uh, Riverside County let them build pretty much what they wanted. 
So the lack of infrastructure, uh, the lack of police, and flooding was a major problem. So in, early in 1981, Indian Wells had applied to annex what we called at that time the Four Corners, which is Washington and 111. They wanted to annex it because they didn't want any commercial in Indian Wells. So they had applied to the county to annex. And Indio was also interested in the 111 area because it was zoned commercial and little did they know what kind of a commercial area that would develop into. So they applied to LAFCO, which is an arm of Riverside County Local Agency Formation Commission, and it was made up of elected officials, like a committee. And if you wanted to have any jurisdictional um, changes, like form a city, annex a property, we still have LAFCO, you go before LAFCO to make your case. So when we heard that Indian Wells was after that area, those of us who were interested in making a city out of La Quinta knew we had to act fast because without that area, we would have had no commercial for a long time. So the Chamber of Commerce and the property owners uh, organizations both uh, named four people to form the task force to incorporate the city of La Quinta, and um, there were eight of us then, and there's nobody left here to uh, contradict me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm the last man standing, so um, you can take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But I have their names in case you're interested. In some, some of them have widows still around. So. So we started the um, idea of incorporation and um, all of the developers and the businesses were against it. Even the famous La Quinta Hotel with the wonderful Vosslers who had just bought it. Um, they were accustomed to working with the county. They were comfortable working with the county. And of course, if you were Simon Motors or Vons, you wanted to be Indian Wells, not La Quinta. So they, all the businesses wanted to stay with the county or to be annexed. So uh, also the, the people in what is now called Highland Palms, in uh, my day we called it Shangri-La and we called it Point Happy, but I understand now it's called Highland Palms. Did that come just when you put the plaque up or was that even before? Okay, so um, in order to, um, in order to incorporate you needed to do uh, three things. You needed to draw your boundaries, and you'll, oh, that's just the code, but in, as you go through here, you'll see the boundaries. It only went to the wash in the north, Avenue 60 in the south, the mountains on the west, and either Adams or Jefferson on the east. So you had to draw your boundaries, you had to do a feasibility study, and you had to gather signatures from 25% of the registered voters. Now you can get something on the ballot with 10%, isn't it? 10%? We just went through that. Uh, anyway, 25% in those days, and we had uh, 2,200 registered voters, believe it or not. So, um, so we set about to do the feasibility study. My husband, Fred, had just retired from state bureaucracy, so he was the guy who was ready to do that. He was young yet, and um, he wrote the study, and the rest of us on the task force spread out across the cities and the valleys to kind of nose around to find out what's, a, what's property tax worth and what's cigarette tax worth and what's sales tax, and tried to find out what our sources of revenue were and um, we, <laughs> we thought we were gonna get a, uh, a consultant to do the study for us. Uh, uh, Cathedral City had just incorporated, so we thought we'd get their guy. He was Fred Christensen, and so he made us an offer that for $30,000 he would be our consultant. We had $300, <laughs> so, so it was default to my husband Fred. So, 
So um, the, the population was about 4,000 at that time. And when we drew the uh, boundaries, you can kind of imagine what they were, the cove of the country club, the, the brittle brush area down there, Highland Palms, uh, the La Quinta Country Club was kind of mixed in their support. We had several uh, task force members from there. So, um, uh, and we, so a group of about 40 volunteers who augmented the task force went door to door to talk up the idea of incorporation. It had been tw tried twice before and failed because mostly uh, property, property tax and sales tax. Uh, but Prop 13 had intervened, and we all know that that put a lock uh, on the, the amount of increments you could have for property tax. So um, 50 we, uh, within about two months, we gathered not 25% of the signatures, but 50% of the, the uh, registered voters signed the petitions. Of course, we registered people as we went, too, because a lot of people. <laughs> so we, we will register you whether you sign the petition or not. The, the local newspaper, which was the Daily News, uh, supported incorporation. We got a lot of publicity from them. You'll see some of their stuff here. And so we completed our tasks. Um, oh, let, let me, the feasibility con consisted of um, outlining the resources that we anticipated, a budget for year one, and a projection 10 years into the future what the budget would be. So we submitted it to the county, our signatures, our drawing, and our feasibility study. And the process with them was that the county staff reviewed it. They sent it to LAFCO, who would have a hearing and vote on it. And if they approved it, it would go to a vote. So the county administration received our documents and recommended against it. Not enough money. They didn't, the projected revenue didn't make sense to them. But they had to send it to LAFCO anyway. We were undaunted. So in here somewhere you'll see a couple of school buses. On the day of the hearing uh, in November of 1981, uh, Indian Wells presented their case for annexation and we presented our case for going to a vote for cityhood. And it was kind of the suits versus the citizens. Indian Wells didn't have any citizens there. They had about three lawyers in three-piece suits, excuse me, all of you attorneys, but <laughs> they were smart, but they didn't have much passion. and. Um, we were quite a big group. Uh, when you see the, there, there's the fire hydrant, and there's a leaky water system. Um, they, uh, w we had a lot of people speak, a lot of passion. We want to be a city. Let us go to a vote. Let everybody decide. And we kind of overwhelmed them, and they voted, despite the recommendation of the staff. They voted to let us go to a vote, as you probably guessed. So we had the. Um, of course, we had to have another. Uh, you know, publicity campaign to be sure we had people to vote. I had a very, I was in charge of the voters and we had a very sophisticated data, database. It was called three by five cards in a little, <laughs> in a shoebox. And we pretty much knew who was going to vote how. We knew who our supporters were and if we knew if we could get them out, they would vote. So the, the, uh, we had that hearing in November. It was put to a vote on April 13th of 1982. And the election results, we had 61% of the 2,200 registered voters turned out. And of that 61%, 75% voted for incorporation. So with the public, it was pretty popular. Um, uh, on the same ballot, there were uh, people running for city council, a bunch of them eight or 10, and the top five were um, then selected, or automatically became city council members. So that was April 13th, and 17 days later, we were a city. We had no city manager, no employees, no offices, no laws, no codes. 
and no money. <laughs> we did actually, I believe, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that we took Riverside County to court to ask for them to give us our share of the uh, taxes that they would have accrued for this area for the first three months. So we kind of had three months to get it on our feet. Our city manager agreed to work for free uh, and work on, uh, live off of his savings. When we interviewed him, he said, what are savings accounts for? So we didn't pay him for a while. Uh, we had a volunteer person to answer the telephone, unpaid. And a little later, we did hire a uh, secretary. The city manager took his own notes in the city council meetings, typed up his own minutes and everything. So, but at the election, the, the 13th of uh, April, the business community changed its mind immediately. They were ready to go. The first people to jump on board was the La Quinta Hotel, and Ernie Vossler and family were all in for this. And indeed, we have, and you're going to see the, the pictures taken at the hotel of the inaugural day, May 1st, when Frank Capper was there. He didn't know what he was doing. He said, what's incorporation? But he <laughs> marched up and sat on the stage, <laughs> sat on the stage with us. Just, it was in there somewhere. And, um, and uh, the city officials from the county and uh, uh, across the valley came. And uh, we had a lovely day. It was a little, little warm. A little, I'm sorry? The governor, old Pat Brown, who was no longer but governor, but former Governor Pat Brown happened to be staying at the hotel. We told you that famous people went there. <laughs> and so um, I think there was a spread of food afterwards. It was nice. We got off to a good start. But that, would, that happened about um, midday, I think, because in the, uh, early in the morning of May 1st, the first city council meeting was held right across here. There was a community center at the time, which doesn't look anything like that beautiful building that's there now, that fitness center. It was a concrete block building that was a community center. So the city council met there first, and they elected a mayor, because at that time the mayor was selected from the uh, city council itself. So my husband, who had led the incorporation effort and kind of been the spokesperson and got most votes, uh, he was selected as mayor for the first year. And um, so they elected a mayor. And then they uh, started, we didn't have any laws. So on one vote, they adopted all of the Riverside County code. So all their code, all their building standards, everything became our city code. We also um, authorized um, contracts with the county fire department, which we still have, and the sheriff's department, which we still have that contract going. City Hall was, uh, became a rented space on La Fonda, and you saw that in there. There's a little shopping center over here where the barber shop is. Some of you guys probably go to that barber shop over here on La Fonda. And um, there were some pictures in there of the city hall, uh, the city council meeting, crowded little space, not like the beautiful building we have now. And a few months after we started having meetings there, portables started to be brought in for the other offices. That was our city hall space until 1992, which would have been 10 years we, op we operated in that space. The first city budget as proposed in the feasibility was for $672,000. And right now, it's about $55 million. Um, the, um, one of the first things on the, the docket to, to uh, tackle was the infrastructure for the water system. And our city manager, Frank Usher, got to be buddy-buddy with Lowell Weeks, who was the manager of uh, the Coachella Valley Water District. We used to call him the king of the valley because he who controls the water <laughs> controls all of us. So um, uh, our city manager um, 
negotiated and and um, and the city decided to go with to have our water company Santa Camelita bought out by the water district and they later did our flood control which the 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 biggest part of it was the large channel on the west side of the cove running all the way down through the hotel golf course i remember the first time there was water flowing through there and judy's brother andy was a lot of stuff had washed down that channel and it landed in the golf course and so here's here's a, a I, I lost him andy andy out there in his golf cart saying son of a <laughs> his, golf, his golf course was filled with refrigerators and rocks and old shoes and tires and but now it's all clean and nothing happens down there so Andy won't have to complain he doesn't even own it anymore okay so anyway um, uh, not only that big channel there's also some pictures in here which showed how CDW degraded that whole wash off. Any of you who have walked up there, you see all that desert, those smoke trees and those uh, Palo Verdes, how nice it is. Well, when CBWD came through in the mid or late 80s, they wanted to, to grade it all flat. And my husband said, if you take all that out of there, I'm going to chain myself to a smoke tree because you're not going to take it off. And we used to, when we used to walk out there, we'd see a small tree growing and we'd put rocks around it so nobody would mess it up. But anyway, it's all come back over all these years, 30 years or so. Okay, um, so in later years, a lot of you have walked the Bear Creek Trail. Uh, the, one of our city managers, Ron Kudrowski, had the vision to put in that concrete sidewalk there. So. All of us, no matter what our age, can walk that pretty comfortably if our lungs will stand it. And there was a, a fence put up and a, uh, a jogging trail beside it. And so uh, I can't emphasize the importance of the Vosslers in this community. We were kind of a company town. It was before we had a school district, and the hotel was certainly the largest employer. But the, the school district, Desert Sands, is now the biggest employer. But the, uh, the hotel was uh, the company town, and uh, the Vosslers were very involved in the community. You're going to see pictures of the Vosslers associated with the Arts Foundation and some of those. I'm sorry? That picture right before that was the ship building. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Okay, so changes to the community, a lot of them brought about by the Vosslers, they developed PGA West. And I have to tell you that when PGA West opened, the, the name La Quinta had such a bad image that along, one one, along I-10, there would be big billboards saying PGA West, and it never said La Quinta, it just said <laughs> PGA West, turn left, turn right on Jefferson. Didn't want to mention La Quinta. It's changed a little bit, hasn't it? Because now, thanks to a lot of our improvements, it has, has changed. So, changes the community, the building codes, uh, height limits, medium square footage, water control, policing, underground utilities for all new construction. Some things that are kind of special about our governance is we have a hillside uh, development ordinance, which means that uh, there can't be any building on the on the hillside after a certain I think the toe of the slope. Uh, uh, that's forbidden here, unlike some other communities. We have a dark sky ordinance, and by the way, in a couple weeks it's going to be National Dark Sky Week, and uh, hopefully there'll be some hikes or something, because I mean we wanted to preserve the dark sky because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the stars. Uh, we had an art and public placement, uh, art and public places assessment, so that developers would have to contribute a certain percentage to put into a fund that could be used for public art. And we had the developments of parks, preserves, and trails. 
institutions such as the beautiful library, the beautiful museum, fitness center. St. Francis of Assisi Church was not built by the city, but it certainly has been a benefit. Um, we have, we were about 20 square miles when we incorporated and we're now 32 square miles. That 20 miles, a lot of that's mountains. So we're much more than double the, the uh, building space. We had, uh, we now have 25 golf courses, 16 parks, many miles of trails. Uh, we have had since the beginning, in 1983, we had our first La Quinta Arts Festival and that ran for 35 or so years and was then taken over by the city who now runs it. And for many years, we, we were called a blighted area, not just because of the cove, but because we had a lot of undeveloped desert. So we would qualify for redevelopment money, which was big bucks for infrastructure and used very well by the city. However, I just found out this week that if we want to apply for funds, infrastructure funds and all that, the government no longer calls us um, a blighted area. We don't have enough disadvantaged points to be eligible for some of the, of the grants. So if you're applying, the more, more points you have for being disadvantaged, it ups your rating. And we don't have any disadvantaged points anymore, thanks to all of our beautiful commercial and residential areas. So I guess that's progress. It's called the good news and the bad news. And just to finish, I think we can all appreciate that we live in a unique city. Our, national beauty, our natural beauty, our, root, re, our roots in ancient and recent history, our community spirit, the diversity of our residents result in a very special La Quinta, truly the gem of the desert. Thank you. I'm sure there are no questions. <laughs> Sir. I just want to thank you, Mayor Hilton, and everybody else that made this place. It, it, was, it was a small town then, so it was easy to get things done. Now it's huge, but things still progress very well. And thank you. It, yes. it wasn't done by a few people, it was done by a lot. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? And I'm sorry for all of you that heard it before. I should have, I should have excused you before I started. Folks, how lucky are we that in a 41-year-old city, we get to have a founding mother come talk to us about our city. You won't have that in many places. So I would just like to... I've changed a little bit. Oh, look how cute. Um, I want to express our gratitude to the Historical Society. We're so lucky to have these people who have this passion for preserving our history here in La Quinta. Even though our city is young, our history is very old. So we're grateful for that. Um, we're so lucky to have them, as well as these treasures amongst us, Judy and Kay, of course. Um, we hope you'll visit our exhibit upstairs, which has some of the archive items that relate to the things that were discussed as well as um, check out the Historical Society over here. You can take this history home with you because they've got um, their books that tell the history of La Quinta. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, catch some of these people with some of your good questions. Thank you. Thank you.